So I start by saying thank you uh, very much for inviting me to participate in this conference. I was looking forward to being in Prague. Um, I've been visiting Prague since about 1991. And uh, it's, of course, a beautiful city. And uh, I was hoping that we could actually be there. Um, I've been to Prague many times, as well as to Ostrava and other cities in your country. Uh, and I've been talking with people uh, in the Czech Republic for the last 15 years or more about things like co-housing and cooperative housing. So it's, it's an ongoing discussion and I'm happy to uh, continue that today. Um, so I have a short presentation prepared, more of a practical presentation. And after that, of course, I'm happy to uh, have some discussion and see the presentation from Katarina from Vienna and uh, look forward to further developing these ideas with you over the course of this day. So yeah, we're talking about participatory housing. And as we've already been introduced to this, we can see that there are uh, many ways of participating. You can have a little bit of participation, of course, or a lot of participation. Just some of the words we use in the English language, cooperatives or collaborative housing or co-housing or for the last five years, cluster apartments. And of course, if you go into the German language, uh, you have similar words like an Ostschaft, Wohnprojekt, Baugruppe, Baugemeinschaft, or Wohngemeinschaft. Um, but we won't go into that right now unless we have questions later on in terms of discussing what we really mean with uh, specific terms. Um, yeah. We publish books, the, my organization does research, networking, um, supporting projects, uh, publishing these books over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, we also manage the online database called Cohouse in Berlin for the last 10 years or so, uh, which is a database which has somewhere around 300 projects uh, that have emerged in this city over the last years. Um, when I talk about co-housing or cooperative housing, I'd like to start off with something of a problem statement very briefly, just reminding us that we have some problems in the world. One of them is a climate crisis and the other one can be described as a housing crisis. This is similar in, in all of our big cities. Uh, when I talk about co-housing or cooperative housing, I usually use these kinds of words uh, housing that is very innovative, kind of coming up with new kinds of housing that are um, being demanded or called for on the housing market because of the new lifestyles, because of the way people work. Uh, we talk about participation, but also self-organization, how people uh, are given the opportunity to organize themselves. Of course, it has to do with community, with the community orientation. And we're interested in projects that uh, are attempting to be more sustainable, uh, that look for a long-term response to housing. And uh, of course, this has to do with sharing spaces and activities. It's a central idea to community housing. Um, I'd like to talk about social ecology and I see the opportunities with co-housing or with community housing to connect some small scale solutions to not just housing challenges, but also ecological challenges. For me, that's a big motivation to work with these kinds of projects. Um, so some of the main goals and the projects that I work with well, increasing energy efficiency and the, re, and the use of renewable energy, decreasing energy consumption, improving the quality of the buildings and spaces. So of course this is important for everybody. It's not just um, creating more affordable housing, but in, in improving the quality of life for people. We do this with what we call user orientation. So this is the participation 
and uh, we look for synergies or ways of combining these strategies and these goals and objectives. Okay, so the main part of my presentation is showing you some examples. As I was mentioning earlier, we have a few hundred examples in the Berlin region that have been developed over the last, well, you can go back 10, 20, or even 30 years. Spreyfeld is the project where I have been living and working for the last seven years. I was part of the development for a few years before that. You can see the three buildings here um, next to the river uh, in downtown Berlin. Uh, these were finished in 2014. It's about 65 flats. Um, interesting here are what we call sub-projects. So other words are cluster apartments. I live in this group called the, uh, whoops, the uh, Spreewege game. So we combine the ideas of developing a new neighborhood with the opportunities for developing uh, smaller groups of people that will share spaces like a kitchen or like a living room, like washing machines or cars. It's a cooperative ownership structure. It's a mixed use neighborhood. So it's not only housing, but people work here. Uh, we have community spaces that we rent to other people. Uh, it's trying very hard to be ecological. Important to say here though, this was started 10 years ago and this wouldn't be possible today without government support. So it's a self-organized project, but it comes from the time in Berlin when land was affordable uh, and accessible. The next project, uh, also in Berlin, La Vida Verde. This was finished also in about 2014, a smaller project with about 16 apartments. So we can see in Berlin, these kinds of community housing projects, they can be anywhere from about 15 apartments. That's usually the smallest up to about uh, 200, or even 300 apartments. So it goes anywhere from one building up to an entire neighborhood. The interesting thing about this project, it's developed with this structure called the Meat Sources Syndicate. It's not a housing cooperative, but it's combining two uh, very well-known structures in Germany. One is the GmbH, so a business company structure with Verein, so uh, an association. So it's an innovative way to use existing uh, ownership structures to combine them to put this uh, project into a network. So as we see 170 projects around Germany, 20 in Berlin, uh, but to give the people in the building uh, a lot of power for their own self-organization and self-management. Very important here is that um, it's, an, it's uh, let's call it a nonprofit form of ownership, meaning that the buildings or the property uh, can never be sold uh, to the to the private market. But also very ecological and energy plus building and an interesting way of organizing the financing, which means getting uh, direct uh, direct loans uh, from 100 or 200 people. So smaller loans from friends and family to make it possible. The next project, um, also in Berlin, finished just a few years ago, um, famous for a few things. It's built as a cooperative. It's a special uh, wooden structure. So one of the, the first buildings in Berlin to pioneer the use of wood. Um, also emphasizing these kinds of community groups or cluster apartments about 98 apartments altogether and uh, a very interesting combination of the ecological goals with the social goals so it got a subsidy from the city of berlin to demonstrate um, housing that is both sustainable and affordable so 
one of the big challenges of our time to build in ways that uh, use less energy, perhaps uh, work with wood, but also uh, create housing that people can afford to pay for. The last project I'll show you is in uh, Bratislava, a project that we've been working with for the last two years. Uh, this is a reuse of a dormitory building and a uh, former, former um, college uh, school building. And the property is owned by the regional government and managed by a foundation which was created specifically to manage this. So this foundation has a lease for 25 years and they have the, the, um, the right to develop this property. So they're working with us and other people to develop a project that is both ecological and social. It's already famous as a center for innovation and for culture, for events. People already live there. Uh, so it's a renovation, it's not a new construction. And once again, a goal to include a few different kinds of housing, including co-housing uh, with these uh, ecological objectives. So that's it for my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question, Jan. So, and, and that's it's a good observation that quite often with these community housing projects, uh, they are combining different structures. So for the ownership of the land, for the ownership of the buildings, maybe you have commercial spaces, residential spaces, you also have solar energy or something else. So uh, you, you have different structures. And of course, you have to use what you have in your country. Uh, you have to use what's available. Um, the cooperative structure, as you probably know, uh, goes way back to the 19th century, very traditional, uh, very strong in both Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, uh, in, in Berlin, as well as in Germany, it makes up about 10% of our uh, rental housing. Um, the reason for this, this other structure, which I was presenting on the project from Berlin, uh, combining the, the company with the association for the GmbH with the Verein, that was created already in the, uh, about almost 30 years ago, not in Berlin, but in Southern Germany. And um, the reason for doing it uh, was because the people, they wanted to do something like the cooperative structure, but they were happier having this model which gave them a, a combination of a network of a very strong network, which was regional and now it's at all of Germany uh, with this very strong um, opportunity for self-management in the building. And they chose that model because they like to use the word uh, decommodification <laughs> de of housing. So their, one of their main interests was to um, not be involved with the private or individual ownership of the buildings. And they wanted to experiment with this uh, new structure. And it's quite successful as we see after 30 years. So um, it's, it's not that it's competition for the cooperative model, but it's a very interesting complement. And uh, yeah, it's, it continues to develop in Berlin and other cities. I, I think I need to, to clarify my statement. 
That's a good question. Um, if we go back to my, maybe my, my second slide where I presented a few different words describing uh, models of community housing in Germany. Uh, and you have everything from private ownership, which is in English like a condominium model or in German, a uh, Wohnungseigentümer um, And that, that's the word like the Baugemeinschaft or Baugroup. I didn't show you a model of that. If you look at the platform Cohousing Berlin, then you will see that this mix of ownership models. So some of them are private ownership and they have a, a building association to manage themselves, but people can, can buy and sell their apartments. If you go to a housing cooperative, um, I showed you a couple of models, uh, a couple of projects that use the cooperative model. In this case, people will not buy their apartment, but they will buy shares. So they have to make something of a, of a uh, down payment or a deposit. They buy shares and when they leave, they will get that money back. So you don't really buy your apartment, but you make an investment and then you get the money back when you leave. Um, if you go to the model of the, it's called the Meets Häuser Syndicate. Um, this is a model which uh goes further than the cooperative model to avoid uh, private ownership <laughs> so people uh, will make a small investment um but they don't buy shares like in a cooperative and there's no chance of them to ever buy or sell their apartment but i really what i really want to say in the end to summarize that is i think it's important in any city or in any country to have a lot of options, to have a diversity of housing options. And that also includes the ownership models. So in Berlin, if we talk about community housing, then we have to say this includes the cooperative model, it includes the ownership model like the Baugemeinschaft, and it includes things like the Meat Sources Syndicate, which again, it's a collective ownership uh, which is really avoiding uh, private ownership. So those options are there. And uh, as Jan was mentioning earlier, uh, I mean, you have to look in, in, in your country and the Czech Republic to see what the structures are, which are available, which uh, be relatively easy to adapt for something like a community management. Well, in the last 30 years, of course, uh, there were some um, alternative housing projects in Berlin, which uh, were sometimes challenging for the neighborhood, for example, when people squatted an empty building. Um, the projects that I'm showing you are, are, are not squats, they're, uh, they're legal projects. <laughs> so people um, either reuse an old building or they build a new one and as far as I know, uh, there are no conflicts with the neighborhoods. In fact, usually the neighborhoods are happy with them because quite often, uh, actually, usually these community housing projects are making some kind of a contribution to the neighborhood, meaning they have a garden that other people can use or they have a community space that other people can use. Um, so yeah, and the people who are living in these community housing projects typically are active in their neighborhoods. So usually people are quite happy with them. Yeah, the, the, the ones that I'm showing you anyways. I hope that answers the question. Okay, there, there are at least two or three big questions there. Very important ones. Uh, <laughs> I was I will start with the, the question about the timelines, um, and this will be very different, very different uh, depending on the size of the project. So, if you have a project with only let's say fifteen apartments, it's much different than a project with with one hundred apartments. So, 
of course, you have a different kind of community, you have a different kind of diversity, you have uh, a different kind of, of a dynamic over time. So you have to be, be sensitive to, uh, to the size of the project. Um, yes, it does happen with some uh, housing cooperatives uh, after people are living there for 30 or 40 or 50 years that, that you can uh, tend to have an older population. Um, this is true of any, any new neighborhood. Uh, a neighborhood is built or a housing project is built. People move in and then they stay there for 20 or 30 years. So that's a challenge for these housing projects to, um, to be conscious of that and uh, to try to uh, bring people into the neighborhood, uh, maybe with children or maybe people who uh, bring in some other sort of skills. So yes, that's part of the, the challenge of, of, in a sense, managing, <laughs> managing a neighborhood. Um, but I think we can say that uh, housing projects, really like any project or like any, uh, any new building, any new neighborhood will, will go through life cycles. Uh, you, you, you have the planning phase, the building phase, people move in. There's a phase where there's a lot of energy and people are active. And after 15 or 20 years, uh, things are quiet as people get older. So that's something you have to expect. That's a natural cycle. The, the next question about conflict resolution uh, is also a very important question. And I say this uh, almost every day <laughs> to every group of people who's asking about community housing. And the, the point is in every, uh, in every relationship, in every family, and in every house and project, there will be some conflict. It's part of life. And the question is how people deal with it and how they're prepared to deal with it. So if there is this idea of self-management and self-organization, then people have to also take the responsibility of learning about what we can call conflict resolution. So. This includes things like how to organize a meeting, how to document a meeting, how to do the moderation at a meeting. And when people have very different opinions, how to bring them together in a peaceful way to talk about it and to arrive at a good compromise solution. Sometimes we say these housing projects, at least if they work well, they can be schools for democracy. Uh, and this means in our cities and in our countries, uh, we see we have to make compromises. Uh, how do we do that? How do we make decisions? And community housing is a good place to learn about group decision making and to, to learn that uh, there are good ways and, and bad ways of doing that, sometimes in a peaceful way, sometimes in a not so peaceful way. Okay, long answer, uh, I think. For me, to start off with, one of the one of the real main advantages of the kinds of housing projects that we're talking about, including things like uh, shared houses, like what we just saw, but also the projects that Katarina works with or the ones that I work with, one of the main advantages, not just for the people that will live in these buildings, but for the cities, is that these projects are successful at mobilizing people and resources. So what does that mean? That means they mobilize people's energy, their time, their skills, uh, their abilities to do something in the city uh, in a way that's constructive uh, for people and, and for their housing. So it's, it's a kind of an idealism, but I would say this is an energy that exists in any population, in any civil society. And these projects are good at recognizing that and uh, helping people to, to get it organized. So that's the idealism that I think uh, should be um, respected and, and, and used to a certain extent. Beyond that, 
Yes, of course. I mean, I can speak for Berlin and Germany. We have uh, a number of structures, both private and public, that support these kinds of projects. From the private side, uh, as we just heard about in the last presentation, we have bank, banks and foundations. You can call them social or ecological or ethical banks and foundations. Uh, they have resources financing or sometimes helping them with property. Um, but we also have public uh, yeah. support, for example, coming from in Germany, the public bank called the uh, KfW, the KfW Bank, which gives low interest loans to people developing their own housing, which includes privately owned as well as cooperatively owned housing. Uh, we have examples in Berlin, like city uh, competitions, which will uh, recognize uh, exceptional projects which are interested in developing social and, and ecological housing. Um, and beyond that, you have some research projects locally and federally, which uh, will give support to, to model projects. So on the one hand, um, there's a lot of idealism that, that is waiting to be mobilized. And at the same time, it's not good just to work with idealism. Of course, you have to think about the economics and uh, give people incentives to, to do these things. So long answer to the question. I think it's not possible to say that there's really one thing that a city can do. It's, it's more complex, but uh, and it depends on, on the city, of course. Um, but I would say at least a few things are one is uh, make sure that uh, the people of a city, including the architects, of course, and developers, uh, as well as people with the banks, uh, have access to information, meaning about examples. So uh, you can't do it if you don't really know what it is or, or how it works. So there's a need for information, especially in a city where there are, are few or no examples. Uh, so I guess that's why we're having the conference today is, is a part of that process of, of uh, improving access to information. But uh, otherwise, high on the list are access to land and property. And uh, Katarina already pointed that out. Uh, Vienna is, uh, is quite strong with that. Berlin is not as, as good as Vienna, uh, but does something to uh, support the development of community housing, co-housing and cooperatives. Um, and finally, uh, in, in the housing market or the property market we have today where uh, our, our land, uh, our buildings are all so expensive, uh, these kinds of projects will not happen without, usually with, without some support. Uh, okay, you can leave the city, you can go to the countryside maybe, but if we're talking about developing a cooperative or community housing in the city, especially in a big city, uh, then the people of a neighborhood or a city will have to recognize that there's some value in it, not just for the people that live in the project, but for the city. It's a contribution to the housing market. It's an innovative housing model. It's, uh, of course, making some people happy who get to live there, but they need some support. Yeah, so, and, and Vienna, once again, is, uh, is showing us the way there. Berlin gives a little bit of support, but not as well as Vienna. If you look at the last 30 to 40 years in Berlin, uh, people that know Berlin know that it was a, a broken city with a lot of vacant buildings and uh, a lot of uh, old factories. And um, so for many, many years, uh, community housing was uh, interested in reusing older buildings, that not, not new construction. And uh, that meant that uh, the buildings could be found. But at the latest, around the year 2005, this changed. Uh, so this meant we shifted to new construction. And, but even then the land was still affordable. But after about 2015, we can say 
uh, that for most groups, it has become impossible if they don't have some assistance from the city or from some foundation or maybe a large housing cooperative. Um, so we, we had years around 2010, uh, we would have 100 new projects in a year or 50 to 100 projects in a year. And now uh, we're happy if we have uh, 10 or 15. Uh, and, and most of these projects uh, will get some assistance from the government, meaning access to land. Maybe it's a subsidy for a cooperative. Maybe it's a subsidy for some kind of uh, very innovative and experimental housing, building with wood, uh, accessibility for uh, groups of people. Um, so th th there's no question that, that, that it's changed in Berlin dramatically. Berlin is not like Vienna. It, it's not a consistent city. Uh, the city was uh, went through the war, it was destroyed, it was broken. Uh, a lot of alternative culture developed here, of course, but uh, we don't have a consistent housing program like Vienna. And this means uh, we're confronted. We have had different opportunities, but now we have the challenges that uh, other cities have. And, and, and we're still learning about the, the appropriate programs from the governmental side to really... Um, stabilize the housing development, like to get anything close to what we see in Vienna. Yeah, okay, so in in Germany, this will be different in every city. So again, if you look at Hamburg, Munich, Berlin, or maybe Tübingen, they will have their own policy. So it's uh, Germany as a, as, a, as a federation, each city has a lot of power for, for this kind of land use and development uh, policy. Uh, so a city can say that uh, they have this target or they have this goal in these um, new development areas of 15 or 20 or 25%. Um, sometimes the, the cities are very uh, clear and, uh, and careful with it. In some cases, it's really just uh, a nice political idea and, and there's nothing binding. So even this is different for, for each city. And then you have to look closer at the definition or at the, at the description. The city can say, we want let's say 25% of the housing to be uh, something like in the category of common good. <laughs> so a very soft idea, which can be interpreted in different ways. And then you have a lot of fighting between the city housing companies and the cooperatives and uh, smaller uh, community housing groups. So it, it, it's you have to look at each city to see what their policy is. And um, I, I wish, my, my point is that in most big cities in Germany, but we see it in uh, Austria and, and even in Switzerland, that uh, something similar is happening. Why? Because the cities are growing, they're building new housing. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the housing market. And the city government says, well, we like some cooperative housing, we like some community housing, and we will try to find a place for it because they see that there's a value for it or there's a demand or there's an interest. So that's similar in, in, in the German speaking countries right now. <laughs> 